Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattle Customer 76. Thanks so much for joining me. Today's guest is Jennifer Jean, and she is online and joining us very shortly. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love the written word. And if you love the written word like we do, please click the like button and share and make sure you're subscribed and um, make sure you're following us on Facebook or Twitter or uh, SoundCloud. Give us a thumbs up or, uh, you know, make sure you're uh, doing whatever you can to let everybody know that you like poetry because the uh, internet only cares if they know that you care and you can tell them that you care by um, clicking something right now. So go do that. Now, for the warm-up poem today, I just clicked the random button. So this, this uh, warm-up poem is brought to you by the random button, which was um, made by Robert Peak for us, specifically as a WordPress plugin. So thanks to Robert, too, who brought us the random button. This poem is um, by Laura Stortoni Hager, and it's Summer Storm in Sicily. This is from Rattle Number 20, our tribute to Italian poets. And um, let's just see what we have here. Um... One second. Here we go. So this is a summer storm in Sicily. After the summer storm, the south wind carried from Africa the fragrance of a thousand jasmines. In the streets, small pools of water glittered in the sunlight like jewels on a copper setting. And there I saw the reflections of the golden cities of revelations. Walls inlaid with precious stones ablaze, ruby and jasper, topaz and agate, emerald and amethyst. Sometimes after the storm there was no moon. The night fell swiftly on the wide plain. Peacocks cried in the distant fields, sensing the loneliness of approaching dusk. I know that I am still tied to that land by something stronger than blood, that land where truth is a dangerous thing. I shall always be two people fighting within one skin, one the sun worshipper, the other muted, devoted to the moon, hiding in the palace of the wind. Once again, that was a poem from round number 20. That was Laura Stortoni Hager, Summer Storm in Sicily. And I tried to look up uh, Laura Stortoni Hager and couldn't really find any info uh, about Laura. She translates several um, Italian poets into English and... Um, has one poem that I know of published um, of her own, and that was Summer Storm in Sicily and Rattle. So uh, check that out if you would, back in issue number 20. Now, as I mentioned, uh, our guest today is uh, Jennifer Jean. Um, Jennifer's been in uh, several issues of Rattle. Um, we interviewed her in Rattle number 53. That was a tribute to adjunct poets. So we talked a lot about that, but, but it was a, a fascinating interview. Um, there's so much interesting stuff that Jennifer does and knows about and um, it was one of my favorite interviews. So go back and check that out in round number 53. Um, we talk about um, you know, stuff we'll be talking about today, but also like the tarot deck and things like that and adjuncting, which is um, important to a lot of poets too. Um, Jennifer's newest collection is Object Lesson, which just came out like just a couple weeks ago from um, Lily Books. Her other book is uh, The Fool from Big Table. Um, and Object Lesson has a guide to writing poetry too, which comes... Uh, with it, you can order that separately. Her poems have been all over the place, including Poetry Magazine, a whole bunch of other wonderful places. Um, she um, um, is a translations editor of Talking Writing Magazine, a consulting editor at the Kenyan Review, a co-translator of Arabic poetry, and organizer of the Her Story Is Collective, the founder of the Free to Write Poetry Workshops for Trauma Sur Survivors. Um, she's also the new manager of the Fine Arts Work Center, 24 Pearl Street online writing program. And she lives in Peabody, Massachusetts with her family. And uh, here she is, Jennifer Jean. Hey, Jennifer, how are you doing tonight? Hi. Hi, I'm doing great. You did great with the uh, pronunciation. <laughs> Peabody. <laughs> of Peabody. Yeah. Yeah, those yeah. Peabodyers are uh, very important to us all here at Rattle. <laughs> um, how many people live in Peabody? Is it a small... Oh, I don't know. I, I think it's just a... Smallish New England town, yeah, 
We're tucked near Salem, just mm-hmm. north of Boston. Um, so first of all, I yeah. want to say congratulations. I was thinking about our old interview that we did, that we did it at the AWP in Los Angeles um, in 2017, yeah. maybe, or 16. I can't remember what year that was. Uh, yeah, I don't remember. But I remember. was thinking that um, you were talking about like what you wanted to do like with life, you know? And, um, and you, you, I remember you say something about how you had so much creative energy to give, and like, like extra leftover that you wanted to give out in the world. And you wanted these workshops that you do to be broader and have a book um, dealing with the, the issues that you're interested in. And then also um, these workshop things. And, and you sort of have it all now a few years later. I mean, this Object Lessons came out, which we talked about a little bit. Um, and, and you just today is the first day you can say that you're the manager of the Fine Arts Work Center's 24 Pearl Street online writing program, um, which just sounds yes. like great <laughs> news. Uh, congratulations on that. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what, what you're going to be doing with that first? Oh, well, um, yeah, I'm so happy about that position. I'm so excited to work with the Fine Arts Work Center. Um, what I'm going to be doing is managing their asynchronous learning programs. Uh, they've been expanding their 24 Pearl Street program, which has already existed, but when COVID hit, they suddenly got all this influx of interest in this asynchronous learning and it's poetry and fiction, nonfiction, essay writing, and I think also the visual arts because they're very big on the visual arts. So they just uh, decided to expand things even further and bring on an online manager and that's me. Um, Yeah, I'll just be organizing uh, and uh, gathering teachers together and promoting the courses that they have to students. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it because it not only means that I'm leaving mm-hmm. academia, but <laughs> because you mentioned the adjuncting that I, I did for 18 years, wow. actually, or maybe even longer if I, if I tabulate, you know, a little differently. But anyways, let's say 18 years. So I'm leaving academia and I'm doing something that uh, is for just anybody in any stage of life. You know, anyone can do the asynchronous learning. So I'm, I'm so happy. Yeah, yeah, that's really great. I mean, the we talked a lot about in the interview because it was the adjuncts issue, how difficult it was. Um, I think you mentioned that yeah. you, you've adjunct, I think at the time, at eight, eight different colleges, sometimes four at once and commuting like every day yeah. a different direction for like an hour's drive. Um, so it must be nice to have one yeah. place that we'd be able to call home for, for the foreseeable future. Oh, yes, that's exactly what I've been hoping for. Um, and I get to work remotely too. I don't think I told you that, but I'm, I'm really glad about that uh, because I have children. But about the adjuncting, just one thing that I want to say about it is that it did serve my family in that I had a very, I don't know about exactly totally flexible schedule, but I could arrange every semester, you know, as I wanted somewhat and that helped mm-hmm. with raising kids. So, so there's some good. That yeah. Yeah. I always think of like the, the gig yeah. economy kind of came to, to, writers and poets and stuff first you know before it came to everybody else oh but, yeah um, <laughs> anyway do you yeah. want what poem do you want to start with that did you want to start with bird yes i do um for one reason uh is that that's one of the poems that's in rattle <laughs> um but also it gives a sort of general overview of what object lesson is about um even it's right there in the uh in the epigraph um This is for survivors of abuse and sex trafficking who reside at the Breaking Free Safe House in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Bird. Rock Wren? Godwit? Bobolink? What are we looking at? What's beaked and broken free from a classic iron bell cage with a blown out hole opposite a latched door? No thickened keratin could peck that well. No claw turned fist busted up that joint. Inside, she was key. She was cheap. She was a flipped bad finger. Now, this bird wings as every bird stepping out of the life with no credit, no reference, and a little self-love. What are we looking at? A second wind, the flight inside the creature that is the holy eternal verb, is who bent the metal, is the mother of a lighter bone, the kind that terror cannot allow. Yeah, just an excellent poem. That was in rattle number, I think that was the one that was in rattle number 50, no, that was in, I can't remember, 53 or 50. Um, yeah, it was around the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you want yeah. to explain just, because we talked about it in the interview, but um, 
um, you know, I can't assume that everybody who's watching this uh, broadcast knows um, everything we talked about then. But um, how did you get into working with um, sex trafficking victims? Um, do you want to tell that story a little bit and just talk about what, what you do with yeah. Free to Write and, and things like that? Sure. Uh, so I attend church and I was at a service just one day and I can't remember if it was 2012 or 2013, but I believe 2012. And uh, our pastor came in and she started talking about something. She, she did, wasn't giving a sermon, I'll tell you that. She just started talking about an experience she had at a conference in Las Vegas and she had gone into a bathroom at a hotel where the conference was, I believe. And there was just a woman laying there flat on the ground. And there was a man standing over her. And they were both dressed like really to the T, you know, like dressed very well. And he was like slapping her face. She was knocked out. She looked kind of bruised up. And, you know, she, the pastor said that she tried to take control of the situation, you know, like try to get help for this woman. The guy kept brushing her off, you know, elbowing her off. And then, uh, you know, he just picked up the woman and threw her over his shoulder and just started walking out of the hotel. And the pastor's trying to call, like, 911, trying to get help from hotel. Like, in any case, she, she was trying to do everything she could. He went outside. He hailed a taxi and just was standing there ignoring the pastor. And so was the, the hotel management was also ignoring her. They're like, they kept shrugging, like, yeah, this happens. And uh, the guy just threw the woman in a taxi and took off. And, you know, the pastor later talked to the hotel and they, they were talking that this is probably some kind of situation with sex trafficking, that the guy didn't want any, you know, any involvement, <laughs> any kind of police involvement or anything like that. And so she started looking things up, she started becoming like concerned about the issue, but she felt like there's nothing that she could do. She's telling us this. And I just started crying, you know, when she's telling the story, she said it more movingly than I, I am telling it because it was her story. But I was crying and I just felt like, wow, this is something I knew about, but never really let touch my heart. And then she said, uh, if there's anyone out, you know, in the congregation that feels like they can do something about this, you know, please do. And then she went on, you know, to other things. And I just felt like, yeah, I write. That's something that I do. And I have a choice about what I write about. And I can write about this. You know, I knew nothing about the topic, but I felt like I could do research. And then I started doing research, getting into things. Um, and started writing some poems and then I realized, okay, I can't just research and write these poems. I should serve this community. So I started volunteering at uh, a local safe house doing, you know, some online work for them. And then also I started teaching poetry classes too. So that's, that's how I got into it. Yeah. And it led to the book. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just think it's an amazing thing. And it's just so important. I think there's sort of, um, I don't know, like two poetries or something. I always think about this, but there's sort of um, uh, a way that that poetry exists as an exchange between people, like as an art form. But then there's also just the, the personal like meaning that poetry has and sort of organizing the world. And, and back in that interview, you um, used a, a metaphor or just an explanation for what poetry does that I'd never really thought of. And I, I, I use this for other people all the time now on these podcasts, but, but you, you called it a, a container for your, your trauma. And a way to um, like have a place for it that's sort of outside of yourself so you can look at it, which is just such, I mean, the, the truth is that that's the main thing that poetry, at least in the 21st century, does. Like originally, you know, poets were people who told the stories of the tribe and the oral tradition and things like that. And, and that's how human beings evolved for, for tens of thousands of years. But at this point, poetry is um, something different. And, and, and what it really is, is this way of um, sort of making sense of the world and making meaning out of life. And so it's just so great to have, um, I think you, you mentioned in the interview that we did that, um, you know, it, it's hard to get like sort of publishable poems out of people in these type of workshops, but, but they're just, they mean so much to the people. And that's sort of an, an, a phase yeah. that, um, I don't know, it's just so valuable for poetry. Um, can you talk a little bit just about that, about like what, what it's like sort of using poetry as therapy, I guess, or as healing. Um, people, you know, we talk to some people who really hate the idea of poetry as therapy, but I, I just think poetry, like, should be, or, or it is in a way, you know? Yeah. Um, well, when I would teach the classes, I would use that as, you know, as I told you before, I'd use that, that example, and it came directly from my own experience. Poetry had been that for me. Um, it, it occasionally is an intellectual exercise, but but mostly not. <laughs> mostly it is the container. 
Um, and I can, uh, and this is what I would tell them that they can reimagine their, their future, you know, from what society or them, their own brain is telling them what it could or should or must be, you know, they can create, uh, solutions. They can use their imagination. I mean, my imagination helped me so much growing up. So those are the things you can put and you can mix them together. And I would, I would tell them that, um, and I have to say, I was, I was kind of like those people <laughs> for a long time that felt like poetry wasn't therapy until I started teaching the classes and I recognized that I had been using it like that myself. <laughs> As, and it's called an expressive mm -hmm. therapy, which could be ex expressive therapies could be the you know painting or even horse riding. Equine therapy is, is an expressive therapy. Like, there are a lot of different expressive therapies. Um, and when I would teach the class also, I would tell them like, you don't have to worry about if it looks good, but if you want it to. So I would offer both options to them uh, because some people wanted to kind of take it to another level and to another level just means like it's shareable with others, mm -hmm. you know, um, and they're comfortable sharing it and it's, and it enters the realm of like a common language. Cause that is part of what poetry is like, you know, line breaks is part of the common language of poetry. Um, you know, in a certain way of end jams and end stops, you know, that's part of the common language. If they want to do that, they can. But if they don't want to do that, then they, they don't have to, you know. And it was, it was actually very freeing for me to, to do that and to let it be that way for me too. Um, although I have to say I still try to get every one of my poems <laughs> to be, you know, in that I want it to be publishable. So I don't know. But it made me feel also more able to be vulnerable in my poems. And... I think that I, I hit my voice. Um, I don't know if this book is like quote unquote my voice, but I started to dig into my voice. Like maybe the next book I'll, I'll be able to say, yes, this is quote unquote my voice, but yeah. Um, and one last thing I'll say is that in the, in the, it, when I was teaching at the safe house, we compiled the poems, you know, that the, the ladies chose, it was their choice, which poem they wanted to put into a chat book or anthology. We called it a chat book. And and then we we published it in a way, but it was just for them, so they could they could have it, and that that did mean so much to them. Just it just felt more real to hold a thing, you know, and just see it there, and it it just yeah, it was healing somehow, mm -hmm. and that was that was definitely new for me to see that. Are, are you familiar with um, James Pennebaker, uh, the the so sociology professor? I think he's at the University of Texas, maybe. Um, he wrote a book called Writing to Heal. He's written some other books too. Um, but he actually had, which, which if you're not familiar with this, you might want to like look him up and um, use him for grants and things like that. Because there's real um, like qual quantitative data on how much writing out trauma heals. And what he did is had originally in the 80s, just as some like little experiment, I guess, if I'm remembering this right. He had, um, you know, one half of students um, write about their tra tra most traumatic experience was like their their issue. Like, they had to write like a. I don't know, a thousand words about their most traumatic experience. And the other group had to write wow. about something mundane that, that wasn't traumatic at all. And he followed the, um, so he had a control in, in, the, um, in the other group. And he followed them and measured, um, first he measured their, their, just their feedback on a, on a um, survey later. And, um, and their sort of a pro improved emotional state was something he quantify. But then he eventually started doing blood tests and found that the people who had wow. talked about, the, yeah, oh, yeah. Wow who had talked about their trauma had um, higher levels of um, like immune function, like immune markers in their blood serum. Oh, that makes yeah. total sense because we store things in our body for sure. I mean, even just, I hunch my shoulders, you know, I'm tense, you know, there's something yeah. going on there. The, the stress is stored there. And then when I relax, if I let it out, a crying or writing, you know, something's released. There's something that's, that's gone from there. And you can even see it when, you, when you're inter interacting with people, the energy of people changes. So it makes sense that it's on a physiological level. Too. Yeah, yeah. like his model is um, that I, th I think what he thinks is that, that your sort of brain is always working at sort of making sense of the trauma that you've been through. And so you're like using all these resources constantly and producing all this cortisol and stuff, which has negative health effects um, when you're working yeah. through trauma and you haven't like come to a resolution. And so uh, reading his work later, I think I read his, some of his work after I talked to you about this, but the, the idea of it being a container outside of yourself just makes so much sense now, given, given his work and, and some other people who followed him in sort of that pathway. But it's just so fascinating how much writing really does heal. Like it, it makes, um, 
you know, it allows you to sort of make sense of the things that have happened to you and sort of get past them in a way that, you know, and, and all of um, um, like psychotherapy is the same kind of thing. It's, it's talking out your problems. And, yeah. and, and what he kind of did is like focus in using um, big data and things like that to figure out. Um, also, pronouns is an interesting. He has a book called, um, oh, I can't remember what it's called. It's like The Secret Lives of Pronouns, I think it's called. But um, it's about the, the, the way pronouns we use um, sort of communicate where we are in that state. So it's really, really fascinating stuff. Um, well, that's interesting because I often think about using the we mm-hmm. sometimes. And I've, had, I've been in workshops, people saying, don't say we. I'm like, <laughs> in this moment, this we makes sense if I'm talking about the kids I grew up with or something like that. Or, you know, my brother and I are so enmeshed in a very bad way you know, that I want to use the we or something like that. So there is. Yeah, it's kind that. of like that. And it, it's actually fascinating, Richard, too, because it's it's the kind of thing where um, he, he didn't expect this result at all, but just fed it into the like, computer algorithms and looked at different ways, different words were being used. And people that had higher depressive scores were using pronouns that were more self-focused. And so a lot of eyes and things like that. And also, um, if you like look at emails between like a boss and a, an employee, the boss will use fewer self-focused now pronouns and we'll use more sort of nouns in general world because it's sort of like your your consciousness if you have um i don't know if you're feeling good about yourself or something you you're like stretched out into the world whereas if you're like not then you're like hunched in on yourself and sort of fixated on yourself is the model of that and so the writing through healing is allowing you to like brand like spread out again you know and not be so like tied into a knot or something it's just fascinating stuff i love I love his work. So that's James Pennebaker. Oh, I'm good. Yeah. Pennebaker. Okay, I'm going to check that out because that that does sound fascinating. I know that um, with the ladies, I I told them, I was teaching them poetry, you know, and I was, I I worked with them as a supplement to the work that they were doing with actual therapists and other kinds of, uh, you know, they were just, they had so much, it took like an army to heal like one woman seriously at these places. So, um, so when I would come in, I would teach the poetry and I would, I would just be like giving them like a seed of something like, this is something that you can do when I'm gone. And we, I would tell them, you don't have to write about the trauma. Um, which is interesting because the next poem I'm about to read, it's like, they always, they often would, I don't want, don't want to say they would always do it, but I would have prompts that they didn't have to write about it, but they would go there. Um, because that, because of what you're saying, they could feel like this is a place where I can do this and this is going to be good for me. And they were, you know, they were in that safe house so that they could heal and they could just, they could move beyond it. So, yeah. So I I mean, maybe this is a good time. I could just jump right into this. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Poetry at the safe house. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So when I taught poetry at the safe house, a kitten was lifted by the scruff by one of the safe women. She stroked and stroked and it whirred. And we read Bitch by Caroline Kaiser. And later I thought about how that stroking woman once stirred from an occupational blackout and found a poem in her scrawl. She'd pressed its soul into memory, then burnt its remains in a Chinese bowl. The smoke whirled from thieves. She spoke the whole in class today to me and to the other sex trafficking survivors. She looked up and to the left, her tongue out at the corner, like a schoolgirl, like a lioness, and I liked it. Excellent. And that was another poem from um, uh, Jennifer Jean's newest book, Object Lesson, that was when I taught poetry at the safe house. Um, Yeah, it's it's just just powerful work reading this book, and I'm I'm so glad that it got out in in sort of one object, you know, not to, you know, use the word object but <laughs> <laughs> well this is this is something though the book itself is an object mm-hmm. lesson okay so an object lesson is a thing that teaches you know so this that's what the whole book is that's what each poem is and i want to say something quick because i just read that about the guide so i don't know if you could if people can see it but this is the the companion booklet to the collection object lesson it's called object lesson a guide to writing poetry um Tim just said something about it. But for, um, I just, I'm saying this to all of you out there. Uh, if anyone of you works with trauma survivors or with um, sex trafficking survivors, if you're, if you're listening in, at any point, you can contact Lily Books or you can contact me, jenniferjohnwriter at gmail.com, and I will send you a 
free PDF copy of that book. So you can use it. It's, a, as it says, a guide to writing poetry. And it's just a very basic stripped down lesson plan um, with the, ba- you know, very basic language, image, line, um, how to te- a little bit on how to teach a class to uh, trauma survivors. And yeah, and the introduction is, is by uh, the CEO of Amira, uh, Amira Inc., which uh, starts these safe houses. I think they just have another one opening up in Connecticut, and they have one here in Massachusetts. So yeah, I'd love to share that with people. So contact me if that's you. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's just a, it's such a great thing, um, you know, because everybody, you know, I think most people who listen to the Rattlecast probably are already poets themselves. And and you have this like experience with poetry and you could be leading something on your own. You know, you could be um, here. We have a whole bunch of organizations that would be happy to, um, pr- you know, provide space and help for organizing um, like workshops for people. Um, they could really use this kind of um, sort of introduction to poetry in that healing way, which is what the what the book is really about. So the the um, the the guide is sort of a a way to use the poems in the book or any other poems as like lesson plans for for introducing poetry to people who might not be familiar with with how poetry works and, and might be like intimidated by how to write a poem and things like that. Um, wait, so do you want to talk maybe a little bit about just how? you go about teaching poetry to people who might not read poetry, um, you know, and haven't done it before. Is there, is there sort of a, a way you go about that or approach it that, that could be helpful? Yeah. I personally prefer to work with existing organizations and to not work on my own and just, you know, advertise. That would be odd for me. I think it's really good to work in a support structure and to actually be, uh, supported by that structure and then to support what's going on. So if it's a safe house or there are other organ- other places, um, for instance, I ran a class at the uh, Cambridge Women's Center. Um, and there's women's centers in probably everybody's town that, you know, holds holds uh, groups that do various activities, maybe writing, some, some of them might do writing, or maybe they haven't thought of doing writing, they just meet and talk. Um, that was one of the classes that a uh, series of classes that I taught at the Cambridge Women's Center was they already had this meeting going on and they already had, you know, therapists there and people that already organized it and they already knew each other, actually, all of them. Um, and then I came in for just, a, I think it was a six week series and I followed the same lesson plan. You know, that's what this book guidebook is based on is all these classes that I've taught because I did have to keep it simple and just use really basic poems and just let people know about stuff. But then if they didn't follow it, you know, it just, it doesn't matter. The point is just as, as you were saying, Tim, putting things into a container and just knowing that that's useful. That's, that's the real lesson actually. And then just being with each other as we're all doing that, uh, placing in the containering Mm -hmm. together. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, do you want to read a couple more, maybe the next two poems since we've been talking a lot and not reading as many poems, we should, we should do more poems. Okay, well, the, this next poem that I want to read is, I want to say a little bit about it. It's based on three interviews I conducted with a survivor advocate, uh, named, and her name is Jasmine Grace Marino. And survivor advocate means she was formerly sex trafficked. She came out of the life. She not only just came out of it, but she became a force for good to help other people pull them out. So she's very powerful um, in this community, you know, in terms of her voice. Uh, for change because she's experienced it and uh, she's just an amazing person. She actually introduced object lessons. So you can read some of her own words there. And the last thing she she says in that introduction is she hopes that my book leads people to listen to the stories of actual survivors. And I'm all on board with that, you know, because that's, that's my hope too. Um, So this, uh, this is an epistolary and it's called Dear Jazz. When you're just a little chick at the bar and this regular dude from Roxbury jerks a jeweled hand out his pocket to flash his thick wad, don't think you can play him. He knows you. And later, when you're down your first day hooking down 14 hours in a windowless salon in Connecticut, when you're in his jag to Cambridge holding a new limp wad in your hand, see how small it is. Remember, this isn't your money. Think about how money burns. 
And when he parks and gets out and you get out and you two meet near the trunk of the jag in the dark of the morning, he'll open his jeweled hand and ask, is this going to be a problem? Tell him, hell yeah, and walk away. But when you beat your truth bloody, when you pass the cash and tell him, no, it won't. Try to mean, no, it won't, because what I did for one or a thousand days cannot ruin me and mean it. Then walk away. But don't go to Revere. He knows where you live. And when you don't walk away, don't break your rules back in that hole in Connecticut. When you do break those rules, like when you let that bald dude choke you, understand there's no one home to lock up. You're not there anymore to say no to this shit or that piss. Your soul is gone and safe and sleeping, and you will surely die if it's really you shutting the door to the moldy blue room no girl wants in that salon in Connecticut. But when it's shut, it's shut, it's shut, it's shutting you in with the father of a daughter, with some mother's son. Let yourself think that. Think, this guy has kids. Even as you swallow upchucked acid, swallow their wad, this thought keeps them human. And if they're human like you, then you might forgive them someday. And later when you're out of the life and your soul returns, let it hurt to be home. Don't use. When you stop using, know it's a sign that you've never heard of the word sober. And later when you've got your own place and a kid and a job that needs a pantsuit and you're thinking about forgiveness a little and you're in that saugus church basement with these women warriors and some weak coffee, you're with Barb who brings Christmas baskets to strippers on Route 1 and you lift your mug for a sip and hear this clear lyric, this swing low, sweet cherry ahead. Don't ignore it. Some long gone former slaves are singing about the brightest day. Yeah, that's just a great poem. That was a one I taught, or um, that it was a Dear Jazz, Dear Jazz. I lost <laughs> on, the, on the follow up. But um, uh, before we yeah. read the next one, do you want to just explain a little bit about um, the, the issue of sex trafficking and maybe how that's different from sex work? Um, and, and just how, how yeah. that functions and, and how big of a problem it is in society. Because I don't know if, if people are aware of it. It's one of those things that um, is an issue. It's not something that's like on the front burner of people's consciousness or whatever. So can you just explain what, what's going on here with, with the people that, that you've been working with? Yes. So sex trafficking is coerced, uh, coerced work, I guess. Um, usually uh, a young woman as young as 14, or I would say not even as young as the average age of, of, a, of a young woman being coerced into this life is 14. And uh, she's usually co coerced, as was explained in this poem, by, you know, an older young man who you know, woos her and promises her all kinds of things and then does not deliver. And usually those young women are from broken homes, like severely broken homes. Um, they come out of foster care almost always. Almost always they've been sexually abused. Uh, and one thing Jasmine told me was this guy that, that coerced her into this life, you know, um, by degrees, uh, he, she said he saw her coming. Later on, when she looked back, she's like, he knew that I would say yes. Like, they just know. Psycholo if they're smart, psychologically speaking, you know, and they can pick out who's, who's a good target for this based on those factors. They don't even have to know the details. They can just pick it up. Um, that's what she said, and I believe that. Uh, and the difference with sex work is that it's not, um, it's not by choice. It's not an adult saying, you know what, I think I'm going to do this. You know, this is just something I'm okay with. It's not that. It's 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 being wooed into it, you know, romanced actually into it, and at I, as I said, at a very young age, before the age of consent, like far before the age of consent into that kind of lifestyle is possible. And what happens is most of the women just are trapped in it. In terms, they feel trapped by you know the lifestyle. They feel a lot of shame. They they feel trapped by the shame. Um, one thing that uh, a word for sex trafficking is slavery or modern day slavery. That's that's a term that's that's used in this community. And I asked Jasmine, like, do you feel like you were a slave? Because I wanted to know as a poet, I'm, in, I'm interested in words. And she said, yes, but I just want to say that I was truly a slave to sin. That was her 
her viewpoint, you know, that, um, yeah, so she, she saw herself as a slave and, and, and she sees herself now as survivor or thriver is another word they like uh, when they come out of it or overcomer. That's another word that they use. So, so the prevalence of this, I mean, I don't have the numbers in my, ready in my head. For those who are interested, go to polaris.com. You can look up at the always uh, updated numbers. My interest was always in, and you'll see this when you look at the book, everyone out there, uh, it, it, I was, I'm interested in the stories because I know that stories will capture people's attention to this topic. And if they want, if they, if they're brave, you know, which a lot of people that if you're watching this, you're brave right now. And I thank you for that. So if you're brave and you want to find out more, you'll look it up. And then when you hear like a story on the news, you'll listen instead of just turning the channel. Now that's my hope with, with talking about this and sharing these stories. Well, you know, thanks. That's a great yeah. explanation. Um, but I should say before we uh, continue with more poems, um, if anybody has any questions for Jennifer, please leave them in the chat windows, either on Facebook or uh, YouTube, and I will pass them along. Um, in other places that it's streaming live, I can't monitor that many places at once. So uh, just make sure you're over on Facebook <laughs> or YouTube and leave your comments there. But go ahead. I think the next poem you want to read is Power Play. Okay. Yes. Okay. And this was actually also inspired by Jasmine because she was she was very, uh, she became a Christian. And so it, it helped her. That's she, you know, that's just what helped her. And this was a, the Genesis story for her and for many of the women I met uh, was a great metaphor for what they had been through. And so I have a little epigraph to start. It's now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. Genesis chapter three, verse one. The poem is called Power Play. The first sin was a pimp's lie to a girl dazzled by the glamour love of a god, the glamour of a grown-up rave, of knowing that is having it all. Then the pimp made Adam into Eve's first drake, knowing these facts you know history, but I should spell it. The players repeat, repeat, repeat. Get shit, then justify. If you want to sell yourself, says the pimp, that's empowerment. And that snake's got something. She could be the power, the new knowing one, leaning into Adam, hissing, who's your daddy now? But Adam can't think or feel he's helpless, so he smacks her. And that was power play. Uh, let's hear another one. Okay. So this is uh, something that really exists, what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, it's called... Uh, well, just in case folks don't know, a John is a person that purchases another person for sex. So this is called the John School. This Baptist basement has low ceiling tiles. Every John looks like his online mugshot, known. Some everyman cognitive therapist gets up, says, the world is like a checkerboard where buckets of crap occasionally crash down from the sky. He cackles, motions. About a hundred guys stir creak on a hundred foldouts, every numb butt shifting. Some guys doodle, they cross and uncross sneakers, loafers, on pencil shavings, on loose tobacco. Then it's, here comes the urologist in scrubs. He's got charts. God, someone moans, loudish. A few men scratch something, scratch the next thing. The itch just moves around to another patch of skin. Then Alexis from a factory booked 80 plus times and shot when hooking, gets up, says, you're no different than I was. Her small face is wrinkle-free under a purple wool hat. Everyone has to look at the void they're trying to fill. Someone's wife gets up, says, gonorrhea, to the crowd. Her man got five to seven with that curse. And now I can't, she sighs, looks down at a crumb and an ant on the concrete while the Johns think shit, or she knows, or just finish. A few guys don't blush, a few do. So uh, one thing about that, um, Jasmine, when I interviewed her, she said that she, she was going on all these like uh, talking tours around the country, you know, to talk about uh, coming out of the life and about sex trafficking. And she said, I really wish that I could meet a reformed pimp. That's what she wanted. She's like, I really wish I could meet or, or a reformed John, someone who used to purchase people. And we could go around and talk do, do talks together. 
And I was like, oh, my God, really? And she said, yeah. And she was saying, like, that in her heart, she has she understands where this is all coming from. You know, that there's there's a there's a void like in that poem um, that people are trying to fill when they're doing this kind of stuff uh, or the coming out of certain kinds of lifestyles and, you know, I'm sorry, uh, upbringings. And they're, and they're trying to address that through their their compulsions or their habits. And she just felt like, you know, I get it. You know, I feel like I could forgive. And I just thought that's amazing. You know, she just has this heart of forgiveness. Um, I don't know if she ever ended up doing that. But I just was always just shocked and amazed by her wanting to do it at all. Um, I'm, I, I'm amazed by people that can forgive like that, actually. So, yeah. So I can jump into the next yeah, poem. Um, I was going to say, uh, I don't know what, um, I don't know. It's it's just weird that I've never, I've never really heard of any Johns or pimps that are like coming out in a way like that. And like, you know, if if a celebrity um, is caught, you know, with a prostitute or something like that. There's just no, there's nothing but the shame of like the embarrassment. And then it's just gone. Do you know of any, um, like, like people that do that? Has anybody ever like come out about it? I mean, no, they don't. It's only the women coming out and occasionally, uh, men who, uh, are also survivor advocates, but no one who's like, yeah. Uh, a recovering pimp or whatever. No, they're not, they're not doing that. And I think it would be really powerful if they did because it's a, it's a viewpoint, you know, that I think people need to hear about like why it happens, where does it start? And then to see them together is, would be, it would, that would be amazing. So, um, so should I read this next one? I don't know if, how we are in time. I can skip ahead to no, some go ahead. Um, I think we, we can go over a little bit because we haven't shared as many poems as I'd, I'd wanted to. We're kind of we're talking a lot in this episode, but um, yeah, go ahead. The uh, <laughs> love all the girls. We'll we'll get through um, a, a good number of these poems at least. Okay, great. So so this poem I wrote. This next poem I wrote because of that term modern day slavery that's bandied about in the news and in the survivor advocate community. Um, and I just thought I wanted to write something and include it in the book about, you know, not actual slaves, because a lot of these women feel like they were slaves and they call them, as I said, former slaves, but about, I guess, historical slavery in America, because it just, uh, a lot of the women that I talked to were inspired by women like, um, by former slaves like Harriet Tubman or Frederick Douglass. So I wanted to to have a poem like that. And this poem has an epigraph. Um, When asked what would end prostitution, one poppy project interviewee laughed and said, kill all the girls. And of course that shocked me. So I titled this poem, Love All the Girls. For instance, little Minty Ross, if you kill her, she won't see baby Moses hidden from sale by her mother, Rit won't know Ritz's promise that the first man that comes into my house, I will split his head open. This girl will not spark and know to skedaddle or send along a song to her mother in Maryland. I'll meet you in the morning. I'm bound for the promised land. If you kill her, she won't North Star, nor conduct, nor stare at her hands in free Philadelphia to see if she was the same person. She won't be crowned general, nor own herself, nor name herself Harriet Tubman. She will never unslave, untether hundreds and hundreds at night in war. This Ashanti, this granddaughter of rape, this scout, this spy, this girl seized up and revealed, if you kill her, the lion of God, of reason, Mr. Douglas, will have no heart to say, the midnight sky and the silent stars have been the witnesses of your devotion to freedom. And Harriet will never, about the Chop Tank River, about that final footfall after 90 miles, reply, the sun came like gold through the trees and over the fields, and I felt like I was in heaven. Excellent. Another great poem that was uh, uh, Love All the Girls from uh, Object Lesson. Um, Before we read another one, do you want to just, what is your... um, like your philosophy about writing a poem um over here um let me see who was it let me find this comment again 
Somebody said, and I can't find it now. Um, somebody said that your um, your words are just so imagistic. Like your poems are so imagistic. There's not like a spare word in them. And um, it, and I don't know. And, and you also have this sort of style that that's very loose too. At the same time, like the lines differ in sizes. You use the ampersands instead of and. Um, uh, what is just your 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 style or what what you're going for in a poem? What's your your sort of philosophy about writing a poem? Well, um, when you said loose, but there's no spare word, you made me think of uh, Anne Sexton, and I think that that might be my and Sexton influence, you know, the part of me that's influenced by her. I mean, I'm influenced by also Sylvia Plath and Emily Dickinson and Brenda Hillman, actually, uh, numerous other people. But um, I guess my philosophy of writing, I, when I'm doing a research poem, which, which a lot of my poems are, even when I'm writing about personal things, you know, if I bring up a river, I'm like, oh my God, what river was that? where I grew up, you know, and I start researching, but I, I do a research poem in order to challenge myself. So these poems were research poems in, in a sense where I wanted to challenge myself to still stay musical and still tell a story and uh, still be accurate in terms of facts. So I look up everything. Um, even though, as I said before, my focus is story, um, but story not with a straight narrative necessarily. So story through, I guess, as the as the person said, through images. So I don't know if that's a philosophy. I guess I really, do, I don't like extra words. That's for sure. I love and jams, and jams. And um, this is I don't know how clear I'm being with it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I like the I, I like the content to match the form. Maybe that's a better way to say it. So if, if something needs some loose, like to be more loose because of the content, then it is. If it needs to be tighter, then it's tighter. You know, maybe that's a better way to say it. Um, yeah. No, that's great. Know. That's a great explanation. Um, next up, I think you were debating between reading Carry That Weight or not. I think you should. It's such a powerful poem. Do you want to read Carry That Weight? I do because um, I've talked a lot about uh, survivors and... This one's more personal. <laughs> uh, this is, you know, about my own mother's situation, uh, something she went through. And, you know, I mentioned my daughter in this poem. So this speaks to the, you know, a different part of why I wrote this book. Not just I heard this sermon and, and I was crying, which is true. But also I was crying because, you know, yeah, because, <laughs> you, okay, because of what I'm about to say in here. So... <laughs> Um, so the, the poem has an epigraph and it's Columbia senior Emma Solkowitz has been hauling her own dorm mattress around campus every day because the student she says raped her is still free to attend the school without formal consequences. And that was from Amanda Hess in Slate. And this poem is hashtag carry that wave. My mom was broken by five or six guys one dawn before I was born. That's gotta be the weight of a king. And she carries that, carried that, right past the police station on Burbank around noon. I consider carrying our queen-sized around our apartment like those students for Emma from around the globe, but I'm just a weaker upper body. I take on my daughter's futon. My mom got it for her at Ikea. It's a lightweight and the idea is to lug it for about an hour at home, right as I go, some kind of science, some kind of art in order to relate. My daughter moves stuffed dogs and pigs off her quilt, helps me slide the pony colored twin onto my spine. She makes me a tortoise. She takes pictures, smile, smile, smile. I don't think I can bear it a minute. It's hers, my daughters, my mothers, all the grand hers. And I won't where I teach. I teach. So I'd mold hauling it to the university. But taking on a big thing like that, sweating, bending under that, you know what lives under a bed. All the weight of my frame thumps the ground in the kitchen as I dump the thing hard. My daughter rolls on it, giggles. My pen is gone and my mom was broken 
by five or six guys one dawn before I was born. And that was Carry That Weight, which was in uh, rattle number 53, I think, in addition to uh, being, I think, the first poem in um, the book Object Lesson. Um, I'm wondering, I, what does your, uh, your mom think about, about sharing that story um, and, and others, too? Is that something that, that you, you talk about? Or um, I don't know, how, how does that go? Uh, she gave me permission once and then <laughs> I just left it at that. Um, she'd been dro dropping hints my whole life, you know, up until, I don't know, I was 30 or something, uh, about this situation that happened. And, um, you know, and it was, it's, you know, I, I understand why she wouldn't want to talk about it very much. I think she's just, for, my impression was that she was glad that I was going to, put it out there, you know, in the world and that it would, her story would do some kind of good. You know, I've gotten a lot of feedback about that poem, people thanking me for putting it out there. Um, and, and in addition from, from women who've been assaulted, but also from other daughters of women who've been assaulted because it affects the lineage. It really does. It, that, what happened to her changed my whole life actually, because uh, she had, you know, a breakdown in addition to my father having his breakdown from serving in Vietnam, you know, and having PTSD, and my brother and I ended up in foster care. So as a result of that uh, whole situation, so it definitely, and we were there for seven years, the first seven years of my life, so it definitely altered my life. And the, I'm bringing up the foster care thing also just to mention that when I found out that the girls that were targeted for sex trafficking by these uh, coercive pimps, uh, men, like almost all of them were like coming out of foster care. I was like, oh, and some things made sense to me, you know, some people in my life and some situations that I avoided in my life made a lot of sense to me. You know, um, I did not live this life, but it just, it feels like a path that could have happened if I look back on certain situations. So, yeah. Um, uh, um, Carla Schwartz asks if you could talk about your Patreon channel, which is sort of changing the subject a little bit, but, um, you're doing Patreon oh. now and teaching poetry lessons there. Um, so Carla asks specifically how you started it and how you feel comfortable trying to garner patrons to pay you for your poetry teaching and offerings, which is an interesting question. Um, that is. Um, you know, I started it before I knew I was going to leave academia now that I think about it. But it's definitely, I'm, I definitely want to continue it, even though I'm starting a full-time job suddenly. I want to continue it because I have, I love teaching. Um, so, you know, I think that the question was, part of the question was, uh, how do I think that people will pay me for teaching? I think that I, why not? You know, if people want to pay me for that, why, why shall I stop them? <laughs> and I don't just uh, get, talk about writing, actually. It's like my, my poetry. It's, when I, when I talk about how to write, I'm also, I think, talking about my philosophy of living and life and, and coping with things. And so I hope that that's coming across, too. And so I think people value that. And, yeah, I, um, I don't know. I had an inspiration to do it, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm happy to go along with it. And I'm glad that somebody's asking about it, too, because I wanted to bring that up. Uh, there are different tiers, you know, in one of the tier, the first tier is some, it's as low as $3, you know, it's not that much. Uh, I'll do a close reading and then offer a prompt. The second tier is like, I'll do a close reading on my own poem and talk about my own choices. Uh, why I made this line break and not another. And I sometimes show different drafts or I'll talk about co-translations I've done because people are interested in how do you do co-translations? A lot of people are fascinated about that. Uh, and, and just various things. There's different levels. So I encourage everyone to check it out. It's Jennifer Jean Writer, like all together. Um, and you just go to Patreon and look look me up and you can check it out for a month. See if you like it. I think everybody will. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's a perfect segue to another thing I wanted to talk about before we run out of time is that your work with um, Iraqi women. And, and through, I think that was through, was it through Free to Write or was it through a different program? But you went to Iraq. Um... Oh, yeah. Um, no, it's not through Free to Write. Uh, it was, uh, I was recommended by um, some folks, the nice folks at Mass Poetry. I, I was a super volunteer with Mass Poetry. And um, 
uh, someone there was asked, like, we need a poet. Like, can you believe that? We need a poet. Do you have one? You know, can you recommend a poet? And this person has to be, you know, interested in working with Arab women and, and maybe traveling to the Middle East. And apparently somebody thought that that would be me. So, <laughs> um, but I think it has to do with because I was working with, uh, you know, the free to write women. So that probably inspired them that I, I mean, I have a lot of fear. I'm not totally fearless at all. But they must have thought that. And, and so I felt, wow, I want to rise to the challenge. And I've been working with this collective called Her Story Is. And we work primarily, there were American artists working primarily with Iraqi artists, women artists. So it's all women, actually. And uh, yeah, we do collaborations and we co-translate each other's stuff. And there's playwrights involved and visual artists involved. And uh, the, the poet group is making um, an anthology. So I'm, I'm now a co-editor of, and, of, and a co-translator of an anthology in development. And yeah, I have a lot of Poems, you can look at my website, anyone who's interested, you can see some of those co-translations there, and I have one or two, whatever we have time for, that I want to read here, too. Yeah. Do you want to read those two translations out? That's a perfect, um, perfect thing to do, I think. Yes. Okay, so this one is by Azhar Ali Hussein, and I co-translated it with Amr al-Azraqi. It's dedicated to the martyrs of the Camp Speaker Massacre, and it's called Hamad on His Way to the Massacre. Salt is spreading, for the earth is thirsty. The summer is a traitor. We Southerners are mending disappointments with dreams and death with songs. We continue sacrificing our sons to the wind, which seeks kindling to feed its firestorm. Haven't days gone by? Haven't you grown older, O oh Hamad? The earth is filled with expert liars and misguiding starts, hands slamming doors in your face, shadows scavenge on your shadow. The summer brightness ran out and it did not give you a shroud, O oh Hamad, woe to the earth that does not contain you. Your body is immersed in the smell of the Sheila, and wailing, Dalailul, Dalailul, woe to your enemy who cast aside your body in some unknown place. Dailalul, Hamad, where is your murdered body? I hang date palm fruit like a charm. I wear the reeds of our country like a dress. Keening has drawn a long night, a path to your eyes. And because my lamentations are love, your heart is bigger than a prayer, greater than a miracle. I am the Southerner, a monument to the endless wait like a loaf baked on the waiting fire. I lull children in cribs and graves. Shake the trunk, look upwards, but no ripe date falls, nor does the eye of God see me. The salt is treacherous, is your trap. They described you as chivalrous. So what shall I write on your grave, Hamad? Shall I say, for the salt you were lost? Shall I say, for the country you were lost? Shall I say, for God you were lost? O oh, Hamad, where will I find your grave? Excellent. And that, um, uh, before you read the next one, um, do you want to just say a little bit about what, what your impression of Iraqi poetry is from, from this experience? That Listening to you read that reminds me a lot of, um, we've, I think we've only published one Iraqi poet, which was Salah um, al-Hamdani, uh, his poem Baghdad Mona Moor, which I think is in Rattle 22, maybe. Um, but, but it's a beautiful poem, but it has the same kind of rhythm and the same kind of like intimacy. There's like a personal connection between just those two poems. Do you think that's something that, that comes up more in Iraqi poetry or, or is there anything that you think is sort of a, a common commonality in style that, that distinguishes Iraqi poetry? Well, I think that they're from uh, the other Her Story Is poets over there. They're telling me that there's this divergence happening that most Iraqi poets are, uh, of the older generation, they're writing in this classical Arabic style, okay? And then the younger ones, and then advent some adventurous older ones, but mostly the young, I mean, this is how it always goes, right? But this is a pretty big deal for them because this classical Arabic style has just spanned centuries, you know? But now they're, uh, the younger folks are experimenting with all different kinds of styles. Um, so this is not, I, I don't know if to say if this is typical, you know? I think it is in the sense for the younger poets, it is. Um, 
And I don't know if it is just among the women also, because I've only been reading the, you know, Arab women's poetry uh, for a while now. Um, I should actually check out some men too. <laughs> but in any case, the women, they're trying, they're trying all different kinds of things. The one, the two that I wanted to read are quite similar. It's true, but they're both by the same, um, by the same author. So that's, that's probably it. But uh, yeah, they take, they take a lot of risks. And the way that I know that there's this divergence is the, tr the translators I'm working with, some of them love the classical Arabic poetry and they're like struggling with, with translating these poems because they, it feels wrong. Like it's that big a deal. They're like, there's, I can't do this. Like one of, one of the people was just like, ah, oh, like getting so frustrated. And I was like, you know, I don't know the difference. Um, but it's interesting to know that that's, that's a, a, a big deal going on right now. And it's, it's fun to be at that, that, uh, the van, you know, the threshold of that experience and bringing these new voices out into, into the world, in English speaking world. I feel really honored actually to be one of the first people to, to bring these voices out. Yeah, it's really cool. Well, let's hear the other one, the other paths. Um, why don't you go ahead and read that one too? Yeah. So this is uh, also co-translated by Amr al Azraki and myself by Azhar Ali Hussein. Other paths for Scheherazade. Like you, my horror is carved by the morning blood. I have no time to unroll dreams. The clock ticks, unveiling the old city structures, the guillotine of womanhood. Oh, Scheherazade, the morning knows how to bite us. The radio brings another memory from a song full of light. I travel towards a city made of coal and laughter, full of red lipstick, like every disappointment. Stuck in my own skin, I shake my head in my headscarf and carry it along a nightmarish road, like a coffin stuffed with a short life. Oh, Scheherazade, come, let's put on our story as a play staged for muddy roads. The city grows in my throat so I cannot speak. The city is a stuffed god wrapped in black banners, an old minaret. My childhood breaks on the remains of this desert, on carnivals of blood celebrated as weddings, faces marked with terror, stories of graves. No time now for rosy hopes, nor to savor the aroma of joy. No sun tremors with a kiss. To whom shall we say we were created for the morning? Tomorrow the morning carries its coffin and opens a banquet of isolation. Let's get out of this portrait together. Seeing the view from above, Closer inspection reveals the luminous blood of the Virgin Mary, the desperate eyes in the street, and from every mouth pours the curse of emptiness. A depraved caveman wipes his face in defeat. Callously, this backward man of the cave throws grains of sand into the face of the dewy and green. The man of the cave smokes my days away like a cigarette, blinding me with noxious fumes. Who washes the morning of the city with musk? Who wakes up a killer of love after the full imposition of war? I bend like dry grass. I swallow the roads within my silence. I carry the depression of the city over my head and I fold butterfly wings under the cover of stories. Let us cry for other paths, O Scheherazade. Those paths are not covered by the grand vault of sacred speech a man shoves together. That backwardness cannot coexist with the womanly body that can dance. Just some great poems here. Um, and that was Other Paths for Shirazad by Azar Ali Hussein. Um, do you want to finish off? Um, I think we have uh, one or two more poems that are yours or? Um... I have one okay. more that's mine, yeah. Um, and uh, I just, I mean, before I, uh, before I continue, just thank you so much everybody watching. I think it's, it's like I said that you are bravely letting in this difficult material into your life and having done it myself already, I know it isn't easy. So I'm really grateful to everybody and, and to you, Tim, too, for, for just letting, letting this conversation happen. It's, it's hard. This stuff's difficult, you know. Um, um, do you want one more question, yeah. I guess, from Carla Schwartz again? Um, and it's a good sort of segue, too. Have your translations affected your own poems? Like, like how is the role of translator change the what the way that you do does it um i don't know what how does it how does it change what you do oh my gosh it totally has changed how i write it makes me pay attention to the english language even more um i'm co-translating so it's a long process i don't speak arabic 
I work with someone who does a native speaker. I, I work with mostly non-poets also, just people who know both languages and are willing to do the work. And we just have to hash things out and talk about idioms and I learn about culture, but cha but about it affecting my own poems, yes, definitely. I feel freed up, just like I did when I was working with the trafficking survivors. Survivors, they were more vulnerable than I was, you know, in my poetry. I would hide more. You know, my sun sign is, uh, I'm a Cancerian, you know, the crab I like to hide, um, you know, scurry. But uh, they really helped me open my heart. So same thing with the translations. I mean, you heard what I just read. It was like talking about blood and isolation and like saying things like right out there that are that aren't sentimental but that are bold and I want to be a bold poet who's able to be vulnerable and as well pay very close attention to language. <laughs> well, yeah, that's an excellent answer to that question. Thanks so much. Do you want to read the last poem to close us out? This is I think California is the one you wanted to read. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, and this is from a new series. So I always got something going on a new series I'm working on called The Pacific. They're eco poems that are um, focused on, you know, ecological impulses, people who seek nature. Tim, I know you and I were talking about hiking <laughs> with, our, with our family before, you know, the weather gets bad, you know, trying to get out. Um, and most of the, the Pacific poems are, I and mean, you can tell by the title, about California, <laughs> specifically about the L.A. area and the beach scene there. So uh, this poem is a little bit different. It goes all over the world. <laughs> And if anyone out there knows the song California by Joni Mitchell, you're meant to, I don't know, hear some of the, the tune going on in the poem. I don't know how well I did it, um, but you guys can, can let me know. So here we go, California. Climbing a stone flight in downtown Lisboa, I dodged the disquiet family begging on Rua Garrett with their rehearsed moans, with their smiling smoke breaks in the alley, by the Paro Quia dos Martires. I had seen them and they'd seen me too, posing the week before in a chair at the Café A Brasileira with the bronze of Pessoa. They nodded, shuffled past, then my alma immortal sat so straight. I knew my chair held the body that housed my home. I felt like a queen crab, like California, home. Like there are no strangers in this world, like meeting Mariam Mosin at the International in Dubai, linking arms on a water taxi, we owned no grips or rails or walls between us and the Arabian Sea. She was gorgeous in a magenta turban and jeweled collar pendant. She explained the pelvic benefits of a squat latrine as our skiff surfed along to the sook, as I held myself up with my core. I nestled into that night like a foundation stone like buying my ticket to Seoul, catching a train to Chunshim Lake, going to a party up a red dirt road on Sun In Hill above a cold autumn fog. There were lots of seeking people there, reading shadows on the cumulus, reading sunset rays over the temples below. I faced east, found I ached like home, and I became the state of California, like a planked pier leaning over the Pacific or a twilight Ferris wheel there, elevating friends in a gently vertical turn. Like me, they hovered a little above the land and a breeze made all our eyes water. <laughs> Excellent. Jennifer Jean with uh, California, that last poem. Thanks so much for being a guest today, Jennifer. Just such important work that you do. I just, I'm sort of in awe of all the great things that you do and um, just such a great role model for the poetry community too. Um, it's just, just wonderful. I'm so glad we could talk about these topics that are so important and, and hear your excellent, excellent poems. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I love the Rattle community. And yeah, I think what you're doing is great too. I think it's great. I'm so happy we could work together. Yeah, me too. Me too. Um, well, have a great night, Jennifer. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, Bye. thanks. Bye. Yes, it was Jennifer Jean with her newest book, Object Lesson. Um, and you can find uh, more of Jennifer's work at her website, Jennifer Jean Writer. That's Jennifer, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R, Jean, J-E-A-N, dot Webley, or I guess Weebly. I always say Webley. 
weebly.com. Jennifer Jean Writer weebly.com is her website you can find um, more of her translations there you can find her free to write programs you can find her newest book object lesson which has we didn't talk about the beautiful cover um, and it's so fresh off the press that I don't have a physical copy here to hold up but it's beautiful cover art too um, find her book object lesson there at jenniferjohnwriter.weebly.com and uh, if you're interested at all in these kind of um, workshops and um, having a study guide to help you through that process um, email Jennifer, like she said, and uh, or, or contact her through her website and get a free copy of the study guide, too, along with the book. So, um, yeah, it's just wonderful stuff from Jennifer John. I always love talking to her. Um, a lot of fascinating stuff that she does. Hope you enjoyed that, too. Now, we're going to take a quick break um, just for a few seconds, really, maybe 30 seconds, so that I can uh, stand up and stretch my legs. Um, we will look at... Um, the prompt poem for this week. If any of you have wrote prompt poems, um, the prompt this week, of course, was... Oops. The, the prompt this week, I'll just say it, was a dictionary.com named Pandemic. It's Word of the Year for 2020. Uh, users of the online dictionary elected unprecedented as the People's Choice Award Word of the Year. Write a poem using both of those words. So those are the two prompts for this week, is to uh, use the dictionary.com word of the year, pandemic and unprecedented in a poem. Use them both in the same poem. And that was the prompt. So if you have one, feel free to send it right now to um, openmic at uh, rattle.com. That's openmic at rattle.com if you haven't yet. Um, And if you'd like to share any poem, we're, we're always free, happy to take any poems whatsoever. Um, so all you have to do is call me up at 818-850-7727, let it ring a few times, then hang up. It'll put you on my call list for people who would like to participate. Um, and of course you can share if you're, you know, friends of Jennifer and just have any old poem you want to share. It doesn't have to be related to the prompt at all. Just send it to open mic at rattle.com like you see on the screen there. And, um, um, then I can pull up on screen as you read. Um, so send me a chat message to rattle poetry, all one word. I'll call you back. Or uh, send me a phone call at 818-850-7727, and I will call you back uh, when it's your turn, just in order of uh, they were received. We'll make sure we get to uh, new poets first. Now, next week's guest on the Rattlecast, and this is where I should have turned on the music, uh, next week's guest on the Rattlecast is going to be uh, Dana Joya. And um, Dana is, of course, everybody knows he was the head of the NEA for a while, um, then he was Poet Laureate of California. His newest book is uh, Study with Miss Bishop, Memoirs from a Young Writer's Life. Um, that's a you know book of memoirs. Um, he also has a new and selected poetry book out that we'll be reading from. Uh, that book came out uh, a few years ago. It's 99 New and Selected Poems, I think is the title. So we're reading from those poems. We'll be talking about Elizabeth Bishop and his experience studying with her. And uh, that'll be Dana Joya, Rattlecast number 77 next week. Now I'm going to stand up and stretch my legs a little bit. I'll be back in just maybe 30 seconds.
And I'm back. Thanks so much for your patience. It's, uh, it's just nice to stretch up and, and get a refresh on your drink and all that stuff. Um, hope you got to stretch too. It's good for the, the muscles to move around a little bit. Um, of course, everybody watching at home can uh, get up anytime they want, but I am stuck here in this chair as long as we're doing the Rattlecast, but I'm having a blast as long as we're doing the Rattlecast, and I hope you are too. Now, uh, I thought for uh, I thought I'd read a poem by Dana Joya. Um, it's actually interesting. I hit the random button and uh, came up with that poem as a warm-up poem from the Tribute to Italian Poets, and that's the first time we published Dana Joya too. That was rattle number 20, and um, he was in that issue. This is uh, Dana's poem, The Litany. Here, let's let's give Alyssa, let's uh, hear this. The Litany by Dana Joya. This is a litany of lost things, a canyon, a canon of possessed. Uh, let me start over. The Litany. This is a litany of lost things, a canon of possessions dispossessed, a photograph, an old address, a key. It is a list of words to memorize or to forget, of amo, amas, amat, the conjugations of a dead tongue in which the final sentence has been spoken. This is a liturgy of rain falling on mountain, field, and ocean, indifferent, anonymous, complete, of water infinitesimally slow, sifting through rock, pooling in darkness, gathering in springs, then rising without our agency, only to dissolve in mist or cloud or dew. This is a prayer to unbelief, to candles guttering in darkness undivided, to incense drifting into emptiness. It is the smile of a stone Madonna and the silent fury of the consecrated wine, a benediction on the death of a young god, brave or beautiful, rotting on a tree. This is a litany to earth and ashes, to the dust of roads and vacant rooms, to the fine silt circulate, circling in a shaft of sun, settling indifferently on books and beds. This is a prayer to praise that we become. Dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. Savor its taste, the bitterness of earth and ashes. This is a prayer inchoate and unfinished for you, my love, my loss, my lesion, a rosary of words to count out time's illusions, all the minutes, hours, days, the calendar compounds as if the past existed somewhere, like an inheritance still waiting to be claimed. Until at last it is our litany, mon vu, my reader, my voyeur, as if the mist steaming from the gorge, this pure paradox, the shattered river rising as it falls, splintering the light, swirling it skyward, neither transparent nor opaque but luminous, even as it vanishes, were not our life. And that was Litany by Dana Joy, next week's guest on the Rattlecast. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, it's as beautiful as I remember it. Let's see. Um... Now let us do uh, me and Megan's prompt poems really quick, then we'll get to the open lines. So my poem was really short for this, dictionary.com, named Pandemic, it's Word of the Year. Um, and then users of the online dictionary elected Unprecedented as their People's Choice Award for the Word of the Year. So the, the goal was to use these two words in a poem. Mine is super teeny tiny, so it's not to take up much space, but I kept thinking about how, um, how um, you know, pandemic, mean, t pandemic means all people. And unprecedented means never before. Like those are literal uh, etymological translations of those words. And they're not really true. And um, so that was what I was sort of stuck on as I wrote this tiny poem. And I've always been trying to write, for the longest time I wanted to write a poem that worked, that has no images. So I thought I'd give that a go again and fail yet again. But this is my attempt. This is All People Never Before, a tiny poem for the prompt this week. Um, all People never before. It was a first, spreading almost to everyone. Not all at once, but nearly so. It wasn't worse this time. For us, though. That is my tiny little poem, All People Never Before. Now, this was Megan's poem, and of course, these are Megan's prompts every week. And uh, this was her poem that she wrote yesterday about this, watching a woman sing on Instagram live during a pandemic. The connection crackles, but underneath, her voice is smooth as a lake on a windless day. And for a moment, I'm not thinking about nurses with fatigue carved into their faces. 
Children at the windows with signs that read, Everything will be okay, in shaky crayon. Emails that begin, In these unprecedented times, Then try to sell me leggings at a discount. Grocery store shelves, ravaged, empty streets, how small the people you love look on a phone screen. I'm not in my closet, not crouched in the dark on a broken laptop with a dusty keyboard. I'm in a cathedral, stained glass ceiling, windows that let light pour in like honey. And there's room enough for us all here if we shed our bodies at the door like raincoats which we do, shuffling into the marble pews, filling the aisles with the absence of breath. And when we hear that last soulful note, we all bow our soggy, thankful heads. That was Megan's poem for the prompt, watching a woman sing on Instagram live during a pandemic. So I hope you enjoy those two offerings. Let's see what you have for us. Once again, uh, send your poem if you haven't yet to open mic at rattle.com so I can show it on the screen. Then give me a call, 818-850-7727. I'll let it ring a few times and hang up. I will call you back within the next, uh, you know, 40 minutes or so. Um, Or you can send a chat message if you'd like to be on video to Skype uh, at Rattle Poetry, all one word. Just say hi, I'll say hi back, and then we will uh, uh, call you back when it's your turn. So let's see who we have first. And the first poet we have is Unmesh Mahatkar, who um, shared a really passionate, wonderful poem um, for Poet Respond Live on Sunday. So go back and check that out, too. But um, let's call up Unmesh right now. So the phone's ringing right now. We'll see how the connection goes. Um, and I should warn everybody that there's a delay of about 30 seconds. So if I call you, um, it'll be sort of surprising. I'm still talking. Make sure you shut off your video stream wherever you're watching this and uh, just listen to me on the phone or Skype. But let's see. Is Unmesh going to answer? So it's ringing. We'll try Unmesh again. Let's go to um, let's go to also in India. Let's go to Nivedita Karthik who uh, has to, let's see. Yeah, so it's a short poem from Nivedita uh, before she starts her work day. Let's find Nivedita's. I'll try Unmesh again later in the show. Maybe if you're around Unmesh, just turn your ringer on so we can answer. Let's see what Nivy has for us, though. Hmm. Well, Nivy's not picking up either. It might be that we went a little longer than we normally do. Um, let's see. Yeah, we went a little longer than normal with, uh, with Jennifer Jean. So maybe, uh, Nivy and Unmesh aren't ready, but if you're still there, I'm going to call you both back a little bit later. So we'll see if you can answer again next time. Let's call Carla Schwartz. She had two good questions, uh, for Jennifer during the show. Um. Uh. Mute you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Carla. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. It was a great night. Amazing. Yeah, yeah I love Jennifer John. She does just great work all around. Great poetry, great uh, great person. Um, so you yeah. have the, the haircut for us. Um, is there anything you want to say about that before you read it? Um, you know, I had started the poem before the prompt, but... Um, um, it wasn't that hard to make it work with the prompt and, um, and, uh, um, it's just a little, little silliness, I think, or not silliness, pretty serious, but here we go. Okay. Let's hear it. Um, it's called the haircut. Lucy wants to travel a hundred miles to her hairdresser. It took months to seek him out after he left town during the pandemic In Lucy's world, she hasn't noticed COVID chic, hair turned gray, first from the roots, then grown long and ragged, which for Lucy, beauty first Lucy, would be unprecedented. Instead, Lucy plots her getaway of how she'll cross two bridges with no crashes, which becomes the chant she whispers the drive long, two bridges, no crashes two bridges, no crashes. When she arrives, her hairdresser, 
masked and shielded, combs his fingers through her hair and starts to snip. Lucy, a COVID fugitive who crossed state lines, swings her hips under pounds of defiance as she, masked, returns to her car, smiling under a cloud of hair. Excellent. That was The Haircut by uh, Carla Schwartz. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carla. It's a great, excellent COVID poem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. And uh, I look forward to hearing everybody else. Yeah, yeah, me too. Thanks a lot, Carla. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Okay. Okay, the Nivy's here ready this time. Let's call it Nivy. See what Nivy has for us tonight. This is uh, an unprecedented pandemic. Hey, Nivy, how are you doing today? Hey, Tim. Good morning. I'm doing good. Thank you. How about you? I'm doing great. Um, so, uh, so what do you have to share for us? This is a, an unprecedented um, pandemic. Yeah. Yes, it's the prompt poem, but I didn't write about COVID. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, uh, so is there anything you want to say before you start? Um, it's basically about a pandemic that's been around for as long as humanity has been around. And I think it'll become obvious as I read what the topic is about. So okay. Well, I'm interested in hearing this. Let, it. <laughs> yeah, let, let's hear it. Okay. An unprecedented pandemic. I think not. Yes, I mean it. And no, I'm not talking about COVID. Lies, dishonesty, deceit. Call it what you will. This pervasive pestilence of epic proportions, winding its way sinuously around humanity since the infamous Apple incident, is now a part of life, a part of us, a part of the strands of DNA wound inextricably into our very thoughts, words, and deeds. Lies, I'm sorry, lines, written on a pristine white paper, lie exposed for the world to see, to do something. Probing deep in our heart of hearts and thinking out loud, we never stop to think of the consequences deceit causes humanity. Ever selfish and ignorant to the core, we maintain our steadfast stand, unwilling to face the truth. Ignorance is bliss after all, but could you faithfully say the present was unprecedented? Where we now stand is the consequence of ingrained human behavior, ingrained human behavior of millennia. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that. that was, uh... And the word pandemic is actually the acrostic at the end that starts from probing deep in our heart of hearts. I didn't use the word pandemic by itself, but I chose it and used it as an acrostic here. Oh, I see that. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent poem. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing that. I, mean, I was going to write so something much. similar. I was thinking about... Uh, um, the pandemic is being confirmation bias, but then I uh, mm -hmm. didn't have enough time mm -hmm. to write, and so I wrote a short one instead. <laughs> but uh, thanks for sharing it. Was that. Very that, was, powerful. that was excellent. Thank thanks, Nivedita. So. Thank you so much. It was lovely talking to you. Have a nice evening. Yeah, have a nice day. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Who is next? We have. Um, let's see. Let's call up Patricia Rockwood. And Patricia's got a prompt poem for us. And um, Vicky Miko has another haiga for us. And uh, Carlton Johnson. Let's see, Carlton Johnson has a, uh, a poem for us too. Hmm, so the ring for Patricia Rockwood. Let's see. So Patricia's not picking up right now. Uh, let's do this really quickly. Uh, let's do the Haiga from Vicky Miko. This is Pandemic Cure. Let's take a look at this. Pandemic Cure. Pandemic Cure. The unprecedentedness of a sweet gum pod. The unprecedented unprecedentedness of a sweet gum pod that is pandemic cure uh, by vicky miko and there's a beautiful for those watching at home there's a blue sort of a uh, monochromatic picture of uh, sweet gum pods here looking up at the blue sky so they're in silhouette beautiful photo and excellent uh hi guys thanks so much for sharing that it was vicky miko with that pandemic cure um let me read um, I have to find it. Uh, Carlton Schwartz had a poem I said I was going to read. Let's see. Um, 
Hang on, one, hold, bear with me one second. I want to make sure I find the right one from Carlton. Remember last time uh, on Sunday, he asked if we would read this today. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, we did. We read Trump's removal with apologies to Dr. Seuss. So, um, so we have a short poem on it then. This is the pasta dish. And let me pull it up onto a, uh, a Word document really quick. Um, let's see what we got here. Okay, there we go. So this is Carlton Schwartz's poem, The Pasta Dish, a nonet that he just sent. The pasta dish. Spaghetti noodles transform lovely dish as two lovebirds hungry and fraught with a bit of wine, red. We're gaga as forks spin between slurps of love and meat sauce. Our gazes feast on it. Mmm, good. That is Pasta Dish by Carl Carlton Johnson. Thanks so much for sharing that with us, Carlton. Uh, what else do we have here? Um, we'll try, let's try uh, Caitlin Buxbaum and see how Caitlin's doing today. And Caitlin wanted to do her ekphrastic uh, challenge poem, which would be excellent. Hey, Tim. Hey, Caitlin, how are you doing tonight? Oops. I'm good. My volume was really loud and the ringer scared the crap out of me. <laughs> yeah. But I'm good now. Yeah, that, that they got to do something about the ringer. It's It's... It's too easy to turn it off because it's so annoying, and then you forget to turn it on, and then it's so loud if you have it on. I don't know. That's the one thing with Skype. See, I don't really find it annoying. It doesn't bother me. I n I've never turned it off. I'm not sure I even know oh, how. Really? I can figure it out. But <laughs> <laughs> um, It's like when Skype is not open on my computer, it doesn't, um, like if someone were to call me, it wouldn't, it wouldn't ring when it's, the app is not open. Anyway. Uh, so you wanted to read your ekphrastic poem. Uh, some people say a man is made out of mud. Yeah, I didn't get around to writing a prompt poem. And I just am kind of like, I've already used both of those words in several poems. Not together, I found uh -huh. out. But, and I was just, I yeah, wasn't feeling it. But the ekphrastic one, um, you know, I did put a lot of time into it. And I, I like it. And there's a line in there about... Um, returning to dust and there was a line similar to that in the Dana Joya poem you read so I was like okay I'll read this one. awesome well let me put the the picture on screen so people if they didn't participate this week uh, or month in the ekphrastic challenge I can see this was the photo or the painting uh, a portrait artist a sort of expressionist portrait artist uh, Dominique Deve from uh, uh, from France was the artist this month and this was sort of a brown uh, brown and white you know, monochromatic, uh, I'm using that word again twice, uh, a portrait of a, of a woman sort of with a, I don't know, some kind of interesting expression on her face for the people just listening. That's what we're looking at right now. Um, so let me find your poem. Um, I have it here. So go ahead whenever you're ready, Caitlin. Well, what's funny about that is the, the artist pick, um, Kyle, I know her from the New Hampshire group I'm in with Jimmy, uh, Pappas. Oh, wow. And so when I saw her, like somebody told me she was like, oh, that's so cool. Someone I know. Um, but it's funny because I didn't it didn't even occur to me that this painting was of a hmm. woman. Like I didn't see the title anywhere. Yeah, we hide um, the title. Uh, so so we don't. Well, but like I went to his oh, website. Yeah. So people stuff, try to sneak and find the title. But we try we try to keep it a secret. I saw my grandmother in there with her, you know, like, what are you trying to do? <laughs> um, OK, so. Yeah. And the first thing I saw was. A dude and i thought of that that uh tennessee ernie ford song um 16 tons ah. which is where the title comes oh, from oh there you go yeah okay so let's hear it i'll put it up for everybody some people say a man is made out of mud god dirt smeared with rabbinic blood as yet unquenched by thought or flood with one ear lent to the devout were shadowed deep in self-made doubt chiseled by varied tools of age Adam's kin are still puttied sage, but threatened by the knife of time, all mortals rule with carob lies. Loud voices thick with promises, wage battles for the deuses, built with babbling followers, pigmented foul by pretty words. Some dollared sense casts clearer votes than visions brushed with broader strokes, 
of long success in mind and means, by which the poor are not appeased. For paydirt is the price of life, deep scarred with lines of peace and strife, and those who watch the world burn must know to dust we will return. Excellent. That was Caitlin Buskbaum with uh, Some People Say a Man is Made Out of Mud, and I hear that, that song in there. Thanks so much for sharing that, Caitlin. Thanks for letting yeah, me. Good night. Mm-hmm. You too. Okay. Um, who do we have next? Ah, so uh, Eva Zymet is here. Hopefully, let's see. Hey, Eva, can you hear me? Eva, are you there? We're connected. Yes. Ah, there we I go. Am. Hello. Hello. Uh, should I share my screen? I'm not sure which uh, I'm on. Totally up to you. It's the camera button if you want to. Your your sound quality is great if you want if you just want to do sound, but uh if you want to put oh. your video up too, go ahead. It's the camera uh, button. It's between the hang up and the mute. You can just pop. Yeah, that no, I'll 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 skip the uh, I'll I'll skip the video for now. Okay, so so seed shock. Is there anything you want to tell us about this before you read? Yeah. Um. Are you going to put it up on the screen? Because I, I am. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So I can read it from your screen. No, you have to um, have it on your own screen. That's the other thing too. Is that um, okay? Because of the delay, it won't be at the same place, so you can't actually read uh, it off the the fine. screen. Okay. I have it now. Okay. Um. Yeah, I wanted to just say one thing. I, I uh, sent this in because of um, your interview with uh, Jennifer John, oh. and because I used to, uh, I was working with refugees, and um, uh, there are a lot of overlapping themes and and uh, people suffering uh, similar traumas. So um, I I. Yeah, so a while ago I wrote I wrote this poem about um some experiences I had with with them. Great. Well, I'm so glad you could share this. It's perfect for for this show. So thanks. Cool. Okay. Uh ready? Yep, go ahead. Seed shock. We stamp our feet as we come in, but snow clings and melts in puddles around our chairs during the class, drying too before we finish and leave. Bisnu is late, scrapes into her chair, tossing pillows of icy gusts that fresh up our minds. Even Min, madly lovely, blinks at this burst of cold and looks around, catches my eye and smiles. I encourage her to speak, but she smiles instead. I'm here with them in their first winter to offer words and witness I bring them dried cayenne from my garden, I tell them, because Lachi has told me of the food they miss from home. Ganesh tells me they will not cook these peppers, but split them and plant the seeds. Note to self. Min did not lose her home. She knows where it is and who took it, maybe one at a time. Her insides shocked, torn, and scrambled by people, maybe just one at a time. She knows. Her body here listens to our nonsense sounds as a soothing lullaby. She smiles readily and is deeply wrapped there. Yet the cold breeze moves her. I smile back and hope she wants to speak someday. Excellent. That was Eva Zymet with uh, Seed Shock, an excellent addition to the show. Thanks so much for sharing that, Eva. Where are you calling from, by the way? Vermont, Montpelier, uh, Vermont. Vermont. Well, thanks so much. I'm so glad you could join us and share that poem. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. Good night. Okay. Ah, Unmesh is here. Let's call up Unmesh again. See what we have. This is Staircase Going Nowhere. Hey, and Mesh, I hear some uh, people in the background, or uh, let's see, are we good now? It's better now, yes. Let me pull you in to everybody. Okay. So, hello, and Mesh, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm excellent. Thanks so much. I'm so glad you could join us again. Uh, you had a great poem on Sunday, and you have another one for us. Uh, what is this? Staircase Going Nowhere. Is there anything you want to uh, explain about it? 
Yeah, staircase going nowhere. I just uh, saw the prompts, and uh, I really, uh, I really felt that uh, staircase, uh, the prompts were making uh, sense to me, and they, the prompt was speaking to me actually. Excellent. So <laughs> then I decided that I should write a poem, and uh, I wrote a poem and sent it to you, and thankfully you called me. Excellent. Well, go ahead and read it whenever you're ready. I'll put it on screen for everybody. Just give me one second. Okay, yeah, yeah. Sorry for this. Yeah. I will start? Yep, go ahead. Staircase going nowhere. Alone. He looked at that staircase going nowhere. Once again, the fear gripped him the empty passages of life, haunting him forever, thoughts fighting mercilessly in his mind, keeping him awake day and night. He tried to find, he tries to find a solution in his dreams and the dreams take him to the empty staircase. Neither the beautiful flowers nor the splendid night can take away the thoughts from his mind. Passages of life gripped with fear of using the staircase to nowhere. Oh, that was excellent. Passages of yeah. Thanks so much. That was Unmesh Mahakar with uh, Staircase Going Nowhere. So glad you could join us uh, to start your day sharing us at home. Thanks so much, Unmesh. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank yep. you so much. Bye. Okay. Okay, oh, let's call up Patricia Rockwood again. Let's see. Ah, and we have the unprecedented from Patricia Rockwood. Of course, you can find it at patriciarockwood.com. Let me uh, get this set up as the phone rings. There we go. Um, still not answering. Hmm. I'll call, I'll try Patricia, you know, one more time. Um, yeah, but so Patricia, I'm about to call you. Um, um, Patricia says my audio was muted. I think it's fixed. It's not. So just, uh, turn on, you know, have the window open so you can at least see it popping up when I call you. That's what we'll do. I'll give it like a little, uh, a little delay and then we'll call. We have also, um, oh, that was Sunday. Ron Lauterbach was Sunday. Um, a little late for Sunday's show. Um, but right if you're here, send me a message and I will uh, call you back tonight too. Let's try Patricia Rockwood again. And if it doesn't work, I'll just um, read the poem for her. But we'll see. So the phone's ringing. Hopefully Patricia will be able to pick up. Hmm, so still not, not picking up for some reason. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I, well, I'll read the poem for Patricia. Oh, we have an unknown person calling. We answer. Oh, that's not. Oh, I think that is, uh, let's see. Oh, Carlton Johnson says that he has a, where's his message? He texted me. I have uh, submitted a poem using Pandemic and Unprecedented, so the one read was not the one I wanted to read tonight. Yeah, there's plenty of time. We, we have time left. Uh, but first, I'm going to read Patricia Rockwood's poem because we can't get in. You know what? I'll read Carlton's, then I will uh, um, read Patricia Rockwood's. We'll try to call her one last time. Um, but let me try to find Carlton Johnson's poem. See, I don't have, maybe, did he email it to, ah, he sent it to uh, my my uh, own email address. Okay, so this is Carlton Johnson's Unprecedented Pandemic and Acrostic, and that's the one he meant. So, Carlton, it was just, you sent it to Tim instead of open mic at rattle.com. That's why I didn't see it at first, but we'll, we'll put that in here. We'll read that, too. Um, let's see. Here we go. 
So here's Carlton Johnson's poem he meant to share tonight. This is Unprecedented Pandemic, an acrostic, and you can see reading down the poem here. Here it is. You can see reading down, it spells out Unprecedented Pandemic. So here we go. Unprecedented Pandemic, an acrostic. Urns of love we scattered here. The ashes no longer kept in sashes of lavender. Praying for sleep, we get none. Retarded by breath, we expire, holding fast, ending our own bitter prose as we skitter, carooming off the walls, the floors to endless boundaries, keeping us on lockdown. Don't you see, we plea, it is a plot, enduring is now our only hope. Now it is clear what we have stumbled into, this masked world without mouths, just beads everywhere, just beads of sweat, of sickness, of safety, deep and furrowed. I tilled pasture without a prayer, plowed and plowed until the only scars, only scars remain. Are we all are we all here? One is inclined to ask. No is the answer from the mendacity of a virus, unyielding desire only to outlive humanity as its eternal host, and then what? Maybe it doesn't matter, really. It only matters when one calculating the sum total of loss fades. Great poem again by Carlton Johnson, Unprecedented Pandemic, the poem for this week. Uh, let me try one last time. This is the last attempt. Uh, and then I'll just read it myself. But we'll try Patricia again and just let it ring a few times. But if not, I have it right here and I will just read it myself. Ah, I think it worked this time. Patricia, are you there? I'm here. Hello. So Hello. glad you could join us. Um, I hear myself in the background, though. So X out of whatever else you're watching this on. Excellent. Perfect. Okay. So um, so how are you doing tonight, first of all? And uh, is there anything you want to say about this poem before you read it? Um, I just, I took a kind of a lighter approach to things. I know everything is just, you know, it's really, everything's really heavy these days. And it has been for the last nine months. But um, I, in this poem, I, I just, um, I guess it's, I just didn't want to be so heavy in this Excellent. poem. Yeah, so. well, I like that too. I think we, uh, we need more light poetry. I've been saying that for years and it's never more... <laughs> I mean, for like like decades, I should say, and it's never more important uh, than it is now. I think it, it just inc it's increasingly more important that we find light lightness and, and uh, humor and joy in the world. So, uh, right. yeah, go ahead and read it whenever you're ready. I put it on the screen for everybody. Okay, it's called Unprecedented. This this morning, I opened my eyes and said to myself, "This day is unprecedented," because, of course. Sunday, January 17th, 2021, had never before opened its pink arms to the sky. As I pondered breakfast, I debated whether to cook an egg or try something unprecedented, strawberry scones. The rest of the day was full of other unprecedented things. A raccoon strolled across the backyard in broad daylight. The neighbor's cat usually skittish, allowed her head to be scratched. And to top it all off, I passed a window just in time to see a blue jay splashing in the birdbath, sending a cascade of diamonds three feet high into the winter sunshine. Okay, the blue jay wasn't really unprecedented, but he is always fun to watch. This is my pandemic entertainment. A view from every window, companions feathered and furred, every day, unprecedented. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that. That was Patricia Rockwood with Unprecedented. And definitely a, a nice uh, break from the, the heaviness of uh, a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about all day and, and for years. It's true. Thanks, right. Patricia. You're welcome. Okay, and so that was Patricia Rockwood. You can find her at Patricia Rockwood. That's R O C K Wood dot com. Um, I think that we've gotten everybody. Let me look through really quick the um, um, the uh, inbox to make sure there's nobody who asked me to read a poem. Really quick. 
Um, let's see. Well, maybe we'll. Okay. Well, let us do. You know, I thought I would read to close out the show. I thought I'd share that that Baghdad Baghdad Mona Moore poem from uh, Salal Al Hamdani, and um, I think that's a good poem to uh, to end the day on. This is interesting. We. Um, Sam Hamill asked if I could find a translator for this poem. And um, all I did, um, Salah al-Hamdani is um, an Iraqi poet in exile who um, uh, moved, it was, had been exiled in France for, at the time, like 20 years since the rise of Saddam in Iraq. And so he uh, writes in French. And so I tried to find a translator um, for this poem, and uh, I just looked on a listserv and asked if somebody could translate it. And Molly Deschenes uh, offered to translate it. And it's a pretty literal translation, but the poetry just sings through. And you can hear um, what we were talking about a little bit with Jennifer before, that same kind of um, cadence and that same kind of, um, I think there's like a cadence and an intimacy of uh, both the two poems from Iraqi poets that she read and this. This is Baghdad, Mon Amor. Baghdad, Mon Amor. You cannot be crucified on the side of a page of a story that is not your own, nor to the rhythm of the deaths that brood your plagues, because there will be no cry to relieve your grief. You cannot be crucified on the banks of the streams your body bleeds when the Euphrates washes away the secret of its soul at the birth of a new defeat. I know this. No wound deserves a war. You cannot be crucified at nightfall, when you did not close your prayers on the body of palm trees, because there is no honorable assassin. You cannot be crucified for the cinders of calamities, for the tombs of your gods, or for the belief of a dying humanity. Baghdad, mon amour, not son, nor father, nor God, no prophet crowned by the church will save your soul, not that of Mecca, not that of those who refuse to share the olive trees of Palestine. This is my notebook of war, the years of exiles folded in a suitcase, too long abandoned to the dreams of the convicted. This is my share of victims, my share of moon, my harvest of nothingness, my share of dust, words, and cries. This is my misfortune, like a comma locking a line of ink. Baghdad, my love, I was crouched in the corner of the page, in the shelter of the arid days, far from the torrents of blood that carry the name of those shot with the silence of man. Baghdad, mon amour, sitting like a Bedouin in a mirage lying on my shores, I cherished my own shroud. Far from the cross, Fatima's palm and the Star of David, far from their books, their wars, wandering in the sand of the dunes. From the step of, to the city, I drag my body from season to season. I trail you along from the couch to the mirror, from my room to the street, between my writing and my solitude, in the shelter of their cemeteries, their martyrs, their morgues. Baghdad, my love, you cannot tremble at the threshold of these ruins of days. The civilization trained to kill violated your virginity. Baghdad, my city forever rebellious against your torturer, Saddam, you cannot groan at the only revelation of this hegemony. Those who rushed around your body at death's door, these liberators are their accomplices. Madinat al-Salam, city of peace, love and the soul of writing, Baghdad, my wound, my father, the working man, died without knowing joy. My mother misled her youth in the mirror, and the only witness to my first grief on your breast is the breath of the sand, the starry sky and God's gaze on the call to prayer. I wish so much today that man had never discovered fire and cursed it to advance so much in its own din. The soil that gave birth to me Today put to death, O oh, mother, I want to return inside your flesh, to hear the beating of your heart, to quench my thirst in the murmur of your breath. And once again, that was uh, translated by Molly Deschenes uh, from Salah Al Hamdani, Baghdad, Mon Amor, to close us out today. Thanks everybody for joining us. Another wonderful show. Always love these rattlecasts. 
Um, and let me tell you before we go that next week's guest on the Rattlecast once again is going to be Dana Joya. Um, Dana Joya is, of course, the uh, former head of the NEA, the former poet laureate of California, and his newest book is Studying with Mish Bishop, Memoirs from a Young Writer's Life. His newest, new and selected book of poems is out, too. He'll be reading from those. And that is Tuesday, January 26th, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And the prompt is going to be right about here. This is next week's prompt. Yes, I'm stalling. Okay, next week's prompt is write an alphabet poem a type of acrostic poem in which the first letter of each line spells out the alphabet. If you're up for more of a challenge, write a double acrostic. The last letter of each line also spells out the alphabet in reverse order. So the, f- the first letters of each line will be A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. And then the back line will be Z, however the alphabet goes backwards, I don't even know. Anyway, that is the prompt for next week, is to write an acrostic or a double acrostic if you're especially bold. And uh, the guest, once again, is going to be Dana Joya for Rattlecast number 77, Tuesday, January 26, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Hope to see you then. Thanks again, everybody, and, and do click the like button now if you haven't yet. I appreciate that. Have a good night. Talk to you soon. Goodbye.